As you may be able to tell if you're watching already, Nate is not in his home, as is frequently the case on this show. Nate Taylor is live from the Combine, and I do think it's probably the time to go ahead and announce, Seth, we will be placing the franchise tag on you if we're not able to come to terms on a long-term deal, but we are open to discussing and perhaps consummating a trade. A use of that word in a context I don't think I'd seen before. It's going to be a weird one. This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. Joshua Briscoe, Seth Kaiser, and Nate Taylor with the beautiful the athletic backdrop. Yes, at the combine in Indy. Nate, what are the uh, sights and sounds of the combine? You got to talk to Andy Reid and Brett Veach today. I did. Um, it's great. I've already been drunk. I've already. Uh, that was last night. Uh, okay, I think it's four <laughs> fifty. <laughs> Um, I've already seen so many of my friends. Uh, it's been incredible. Uh, yes, we did talk to. I love how they do this. We're gonna get into it a little bit, but yes, Brett Veach and Andy Reid talked to us, and then things happened after we talked to them. <laughs> um, you know, funny how that works. You know, you Eric don't Fisher meet. and Mitch Schwartz, their their spot safe this year. You think? Oh, I mean. <laughs> We look forward to having both of those guys back. Actually, uh, Rick just put a piece of paper in front of me. Yep, he could be back by training camp. And, yeah, he should be good to go for the opener. And, uh, yeah, yeah. you want, you want, you want that? Jerry Higgins in a third who says no. Yeah, you want, you want that? I you want that, uh, you want that piece of whole show. I'm sorry, Nate. You want that piece of paper? Yeah, give that paper back to Rick. Um, let, let, let him know that we can also call them to ensure them that they are no longer. Uh, employed by us uh, as soon as this is over because um, kids that happened once um, <laughs> <laughs> unbelievable man yeah let's um let's have a press conference where we talk about what we think we should do with our first round pick and then as soon as this is done call the Baltimore Ravens back like so we can we can get that trade down it's lion uh, season baby it is it, not tiger season it is lion season nice. so um it, it's it's an awesome time. I mean, Indianapolis has been uh, gorgeous with its weather. Uh, obviously, this still feels much like a second home for me, uh, having covered the Indiana Pacers for the Indianapolis Star. Um, and yeah, you know, I haven't had a, I haven't had St. Elmo's or Harry and Izzy's yet, but that will happen. Uh, I did ask Andy Reid. He did have a shrimp cocktail already, fellas. Wow. Um, so we are we are all the way back. Um, Andy wanted to talk about the, you know, it's nice to be on that high of winning a Super Bowl, of, of the cheers and the adulation and the hosting of the trophy. And then he got to go to California for like, I think, eight days and have a legitimate vacation. And he came back and he looked at rested. His eyes were 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 fully like clear again. It was awesome. He didn't have bags under him. Uh like he had watched 18 hours of tape a day, uh, which is impossible to do, but he'll somehow find a way to do it. And then he said, you know, you gotta you always gotta go back to the basics. You always gotta be humble. You always gotta like we have to start from the beginning again. Um, you know, you you go through the process. He's so process oriented. And then he had shrimp cocktails or, you know, he had a shrimp cocktail with the cocktail sauce just um, infused with horseradish sauce from St. Elmo's. And then it, the sinuses get cleared and we are officially back to off season mode. That is square one. The season, the off season cannot begin until you have sinus clearing shrimp cocktail. I feel like that is the, the official flavor and sensation of the NFL combine is horseradish hitting your upper sinuses out of the cocktail sauce. I have not gotten to experience this myself. I've just heard oh. tale of it so much that it is only grown in its uh, in its mythos. Is it is it weird that I ask them to put more every year? I'm like, no. just, just give me a little extra. Give me a little I extra. I want to I want my I want my nose to burn. Yeah. <laughs> I would rather have a little bit of the rest of whatever cocktail sauce is and more horseradish in that trade. I think that's great. That's fine. Uh, but, but you know, uh, put a little lemon on it. Now we got some flavor. We got some zest and some, yeah, nose clearing. St. Elmo's is great. Thank you, Dakota White. It's it's amazing. Um, Seth, one, are you a shrimp cocktail guy? I only eat horseradish during a Seder service, Josh. So 
Can I can I tell a brief That's story? That's a little complicating for your brand, I think. Go ahead, Nate. Um, <laughs> as I've told you all before, a Christian been... Seder service. Hang on, wait, wait. <laughs> go ahead, go okay, ahead, no, Nate. No, Tucker no. just cuts Seth's mic. <laughs> so Sneed for AJ Brown straight up. Who says no? I'm in on that one. Okay. Um. So Deontay Johnson's in a contract year. I'm sorry, Nate. A cup. No, it's great. A couple years ago, I was in Kilroy's. Then I'm gonna get to St. Elmo's. But Kilroy's is the local sports we got bar. Some time, man. You come back after the Pacers game, and it's a great time. Um, I, I think this was in the pre-Only Wear Games. This is in the Times R's era where uh-huh. uh, I I did see, was it Mike Vrabel? No, it was, it was Bill O'Brien. Bill O'Brien yeah. did the had his glasses on his head the entire time uh, trying to uh, heap praise on himself for getting to the divisional round before he gave up a 24 point lead. Uh, let's never forget that kids. Uh, there was one time where me and uh, a couple fellow writers um, had, had a uh, St. Elmo's and this was the first time I was presenting the experience to like, uh, I mean, God, who was all there. I, I want to say it was Brooke Pryor's first time at St. Elmo's. I can't remember or not, but like, uh, she may have been the newbie of, of the time at that, the newbie in the room at that time, but like, we're doing this, and there's Dan Marino. Like, I could go and <laughs> touch Dan Marino. Who gonna be y'all coach? <laughs> <laughs> like, could just whisper to Dan Marino, hey, take me back to 1994, dog. What was it like? And then on the other side, um, was a head coach who's still in the league that I will not name. That is St. Elmo's in late February of our Lord in the NFL offseason. Um, so, of course, I asked Andrew today, what did he specifically order and have at St. Elmo's alongside Steve Spagnuolo and Peter Schrager? Sitting face, between the two of them? Face, was that face, for a picture or was he there the whole time? Was that Matt no, no. Nagy's seat? Right. I think it was just for the pictures, my understanding. Okay. I haven't seen Peter yet. I would love to talk to him about it. Uh but yeah, I, again, we're just giving you color, guys, before we get to deep discussions about potentially Legarius Sneed having already played his last game as a cheat. Anyway, back to the color. So I'm assuming Peter Schrager just We're sat still in down. the welcome portion of the rundown. Yeah, this is course. when they get to talk You're about whatever location he's at. <laughs> of course. Yes, Brian Parrott. I wanted to ask Dan Marino, what was it like going shot for shot with Joe Montana in the 1994 wild card round? Of course I wanted to do that. But then Cooler has prevailed and said, eat more of your gigantic steak, which why do they – why do what? Where are these cows coming from? I mean, I know they're I know where they're coming from. I know they're being processed a certain way. That is a 34 ounce steak. Unbelievable. Whose table is it going to? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, there's a little asparagus on the table. Who knows if they ate it? Who knows? Can't tell you. There might be some carrots from what I could tell in the photo. I mean, guys, I did a detailed thorough analysis of this but of course there's a steak there i gotta ask andy what steak was it gentlemen tell me what steak did andy reed have at saint elmo's on a monday before the combine started today seth are you a steak guy um i do like a good steak but i i generally don't find that a good steak like a great steak is that much better than a good steak that it really how dare you for me so how it's not i'm more of a i'm more of a burger you. and normal barbecue type guy um more of a pizza guy basically i am like fifth generation trailer trash and <laughs> that's my palate and i'm very proud of that what so like what so yeah like you give me the option of like, hey, we got this steak, but you know, we also made some pizza rolls, and I'm like, oh my god, sign me up. Rolls? Yeah, like, are these pepperoni pizza rolls? I mean, you didn't put them in the oven, did you? You put them in the microwave, so they're kind of like soggy, right? So I'm gross. 
And I regret a lot of things that I just said. So there you go. But no, I'm more, so I, I'm, I'm not a big steak guy. It's, it's not enough bang for my buck. I think it tastes good, but I'm also like, you know what? I could have gotten a burger for a fifth of this price and been just as happy. What a time. What a time. What's your, what's I your guess? I am not the Dan Orlovsky. What's your, Jake what's your guess, Seth? <laughs> Ooh, a nice kind little two-pound lobster tail. <laughs> kind of the Dan Orlovsky of this show, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, how do you order yes, your steaks, Lord. Seth? I how to order my steaks? I usually get, I usually go medium rare. All right, that's fine. We're okay, fine here. Yeah, All right, yeah, so yeah, just say the name that. of this cut of steak. I'm not a huge steak guy. I've been interviewing you, so I didn't have to show my butt on this one. But <laughs> I see some people have said tomahawk. Uh, I don't think porter, it's that big. Porterhouse, uh, ribeye. Nobody said T bone yet. Um, I think I, I saw T bone. I thought about. Okay. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go ribeye personally, Seth. Will you okay. just say the name of a steak? Say a cut of a steak. The uh, ribeye. Why not? Don't say, say the same one I say. Say filet mignon. Is sure, that what it was? Um, gentlemen, ladies, it was a ribeye. Let's go. A smaller than you would think. Ribeye is how mm. Andy Reid told me today hey trying to keep the weight now hey trying to just enjoy time hey i've been here every year since 1999 everything i know about steak is from one segment on letter kenny so there's just not a whole lot i know about steak ribeyes are excellent if done properly now i did not get the uh cooking instructions from andy reed we did not have enough time um but yeah a little asparagus some carrots here and there maybe a potato or two and then a nice ribeye um and and this is this is the start of this man's uh off season as your head coach of the kansas city chiefs well, guys, you know where the stakes are high in Legereus Sneed's contract discussion. Nice. He Let's is a talk Hall about of it. Fame professional broadcaster, ladies and gentlemen. You cannot get these segues <laughs> just any aware, okay? We did not plan this. He had no idea I was going to talk about steak in St. Elmo's and cocktail sauce and shrimp cocktails mm -hmm. at that. And... The beloved Pacers, how in the world did y'all lose to the Toronto Raptors last night? He doesn't know any of this was going to happen, and yet still, as he, he rises, as he rises from his own ashes, Josh Briscoe, <laughs> professional broadcaster, commenter Jake Dennis makes a good yeah, point. Josh, have you ever point. considered a career in radio? Yeah, that's Ever? really that's that's a very Ever? good comment. That's very funny, Jake. I'll, I'll crack that one open later on because I would like All to right. talk about Legarius Sneed sooner rather than later. But sure, it's extremely extremely funny. Um, oh God, I'm gonna have to look away from the comments now because now they're about me. It's easy for me to co to read them and do the show when they're about you guys. When they're about me. It's more distracting. <laughs> so, uh, Brett Veach got up at the podium and said, yeah, we're probably going to use the tag. And we were all like, that's probably going to be on the Jerry Sneed. And then, Nate, I'll let you sprinkle in the other, any info from the other conversations you guys had. But that was sort of the starting point. And I'm going to lay this out here now. I'm going to give us all some credit. I, I think on Friday, I floated out the little balloon of like, hey, so what do you... What do we think the Chiefs could get in a trade for Legereus Sneed if that's the way it goes? And right. then Seth, about two hours ago, texted our group chat like, hey, I'm kind of afraid to say my real opinions on Twitter or whatever, but I'm trying to figure out how to be like, hey, what could the Chiefs get in a trade for Legereus Sneed? And then at about 3.30 Central Time, Jeremy Fowler tweets that the Chiefs have informed Legereus Sneed they're prepared to use the franchise tag. And this is where the word consummate comes in. Uh, and are open to consummate a trade off it if no long-term deal is reached. Is there, and, and is, right on top of that tag, is there, I guess. Look, I know we have the tag. I know we have the zipper game. But is 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 the gold – that's the gold medal, the zipper game. Sure. Is silver medalist open to consummate? On the tag. Uh, that's not what I said. That's not what I tag? That's not what I said, Seth. I said open. Uh, maybe I'm open to open consummate. to consummate is a lot. <laughs> no, I feel I'm like open consummate to is consummate. Consummate's a bigger deal than that. Consummate feels like a commitment. I don't know that you, I don't 
I'm not sure if that's proper usage of the phrase. Uh, and then Fowler added that Snead's agreeable to the scenario, giving him a chance to talk with other teams while KC remains in play. Are I'll you open give to you... consummate? Because I'm open to consummate. I'm open to consummate this trade for the Chiefs and the Jarius Snead and whoever it may be, if the price is right. Um, but uh, Nate, with that being the, the news of the day here, what else have you heard about that? And then pretty soon we're going to, I mean, Seth's already been pitching uh, trade ideas throughout the first uh, 15 minutes of the show or so. But what is the the market right now? As I'm sure you will have more information on that by Thursday's show, frankly, because yeah, you're going to have a whole lot more shrimp by then. Yeah, a lot more shrimp, a lot more, uh, a lot more cocktails of different varieties. Um, so, look, this is where it was headed. I'm actually a little surprised that it... Um, it moved this fast because I thought this was going to be the news potentially tomorrow. Um, my understanding is that, and, I, and this is going to be in the athletic. So there's, I have to remind people that Brent Tillis, the capologist, if that's what you want to say, the cap, the top cap guy, the guy who helps structure the contracts alongside uh, Brett Beast, the general manager, and Clark Hunt, the owner. And Did they call him the captain. No, he didn't professional really like that. broadcaster right there. <laughs> Seth, uh, do I have an exciting opportunity for you? <laughs> maybe a little sprinkle of Mark Donovan, the team president, so he can stay in the loop. Um, but other, you know, those are the guys who usually put the 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 contracts together, right? So now it's Chris Shea who's been elevated to where Brent Tillis was before he left for the Carolina Panthers. Oh my God, he has a seat at the table with with <laughs> with David freaking tapper pray for this man y'all he couldn't have got enough money i'm dead serious brent tillis if this what it gotta take to be a gm i'm sorry dog i'm so sorry because that's ultimately what he wants to be but he's like some vice president to vice president he's telling the owner what to do problem is the owner's david tapper Godspeed, sir. Godspeed. I hope he. I hope he wrote his own contract. I really do. <laughs> I really Honestly. do too. Um. So now it's again of of my understanding, it's Chris Shea, Brett Veach, uh, meeting with Michael Hugh Ho, which is the agent for Legeria Sneed. Uh, as of yesterday, I didn't want to report it yesterday because again, it was it was developing, but I wasn't necessarily sure. Definitely wanted to give the opportunity to have a conversation with Brett Veach about this. But even as of yesterday, it was trending that the franchise tag was definitely going to Legereus Sneed. Um, there were multiple people that I talked to around the league that said, what's going to happen with Chris Jones? Just because everybody has gathered that it only makes sense for the Chiefs to use the franchise tag on Legereus Sneed. Now, the number is a little bit higher than we anticipated because the cap has gone up more than we anticipated. So it's basically $20 million. Uh, which is top of essentially the top of the cornerback market. Um, if that's what they chose to do, um, Legereus wants to remain with the Chiefs. I want to make that very clear. Legereus Need would prefer to play for the Kansas City Chiefs in 2024. The issue is Clark Hunt might not want to pay Legereus Need and Chris Jones top money. Um, even with a more expanded cap, salary cap than than before. So now the general manager and Chris Shea, the top, you know, salary cap expert, have to use the franchise tag to weaponize a deadline for themselves and the rest of the league. Either he's getting traded before the draft or they're going to agree to a long-term deal. There will be teams willing to negotiate with the Jerry Sneed and the Kansas City Chiefs about a potential trade. Um, he is now for business. And uh, when you make a decision this quickly, ladies and gentlemen, that usually means that player who hasn't even been put on the franchise tag yet is getting traded. Seth, I'm not getting any audio from you at all. So if you muted yourself a little bit ago. Yeah, I, I muted myself just because I was taking a giant drink of uh, my unnamed drink here that has caffeine. Thank in you. It, it doesn't so, pay us yet. 
Something that's interesting <laughs> to think about in terms of Legereus Sneed being tagged by the Chiefs and potentially traded is that the Chiefs are actually differently situated than basically the entire rest of the NFL when it comes to the cornerback situation. Mm-hmm. Most other contending teams are not happy with their corner situation. Uh, most contending teams don't have one elite corner. And the Chiefs are in the rare situation where Snead is, is he played at an elite level this year. He's a great corner. He might not be the best corner on his own team because Trent McDuffie, seriously, if you have access to all 22, watch Trent McDuffie in the Super Bowl. Uh, uh, Snead, Snead played exceptionally well. It's disgustingly technique sound. M- McDuffie played so well, about as well as I've seen anyone play at that position. Anyway. And it's not just that, it's the Chiefs have guys in Williams and Watson who are not, you know, they're not high level at this point, but they both played a ton of snaps and they've been solid. They also have a guy in Johnson who was getting snaps over them this training camp that they really yes. like who's coming back. Nazi Johnson coming back from a torn ACL himself. Um, right. Yes, could be a rotational piece next season if all goes well it wouldn't surprise any of us if echo boydo was like a fine cornerback at the at, by by it's, late it's, season exactly. next year you and special they, humor, right yep they they let charvarius ward walk when charvarius ward's a good corner and they they've bet on their system we just watched them turn shamari connor into a good safety during the season mm-hmm. i mean he, they, they've shown this they know they've got merit for a few more years They've shown the ability to find the right guys for their system. They know that Merritt can develop them. They've, they, they, they've got a really good plug-and-play system here, but they've got way more depth and more top-end talent than basically any team in the league. Now, what we talked about when I did the whole if I were Brett Veach thing, you can build a defense around having two elite corners, and the Chiefs did. You can do all sorts of fun stuff there. However, you don't need to, especially if you are going to keep Chris Jones, because then you know what you can build your defense around? Chris Jones and Trent McDuffie. You can do that and have a really, really, really good defense. And then suddenly all these questions about cap space and receivers and rebuilding the offense a little more because what they did this year was not a... And one good thing, unlike last year, I think fans, Chiefs fans understand 2023 was not a template. That's not like a, hey, this is how the Chiefs should do things moving forward. Kelsey will not last much longer having to carry that much of the load. Rasheed Rice basically saved their season, mm-hmm. but Patrick they, Mahomes might not last that much longer with the, yeah, with the way this regular it's season went. Way, it's way too much. So the biggest thing is that other teams, they see a guy like like for the Chiefs, they see Snead going. It's like, oh, that's a bummer because he can do a lot of good things, but the defense could still be very, very good. Other teams are like, we don't have any corners that we really like, and that's it's an incredibly rare. Um, hey it's guys, an incredibly rare thing. Pull so up I, the Puka Nakua dunk contest against the Detroit Lions in the wild card round. I know Detroit won that game. Puka Nakua was never not open. Never right. not. And so open. a team, a team like the Lions, a team like the Eagles, a team like the 49ers, all these. There are a lot of teams out there that are not happy. Contenders that are not happy with their corners. Whereas the Chiefs, they're pretty happy so i'm not saying by the way cheese fans also any team that trades for him would be trading for him and the quote unquote opportunity to give him a large contract yes so that 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 depresses the value so i mean a lot of people are like oh a first two first rounders you're not you're not getting you're not getting a first round i was just about to say this yeah ladies and gentlemen the chiefs are not getting a first round pick for legerious need as as much as you love him and as well he fits the chief system um i think as of right now, um, early into the reporting, um, the best, I don't want to say the best case scenario, but one of the best case scenarios is if the Chiefs is to get a, is if the Chiefs are to exchange Legereus Knee for a second round pick. Uh, of course, they have 64 because they won the Super Bowl. So as I texted the fellas earlier today, you're looking somewhere in that mid second round level, a top 50 pick. Um, and so you know the the most recent time the Chiefs did this was with D Ford in 2019 they got a second round pick from the San Francisco 49ers uh not realizing that both teams were going to play one another uh later that year in the Super Bowl um that trade actually worked out for both teams um when you look back at it um but yeah the the ability to get a first rounder is really really hard considering 
the amount of talent in this year's draft class and the fact that, as Seth said, LeJarius Need wants a three- or a four-year deal, regardless of who it is, right, whether it's with the Chiefs or with his next team. Uh, and he should. should. That He's happen. 27. Yes. If this he is gets, it. If he gets a three-year deal, that will give him uh, the chance to – uh, go back to the open market at 30 because uh, you're not going to franchise. You usually would not franchise tag a 30 year old player. Um, and of course, he would have already been franchise tagged a, 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 a previous time in his career. And obviously, with a four year deal, there's a little bit of a wiggle room as to whether or not you could make it to the fourth year or not. But anyway, um, just from a contract structure, a three year deal might work for some teams, a four year deal may work better for other teams in terms of their salary cap sheet. So that's what he wants. The Chiefs know that. Um, the Chiefs, are, I think, are interested in, in a potential sort of three-year deal. Um, the issue, though, becomes how are you going to make it work? How are you going to structure it all? And, again, to, like you guys have said earlier, what about receiver? What about left tackle? What about, um, you know, the potential of probably needing another linebacker? Tight end becomes um, a, a rising sort of priority to some degree. Um, and then, of course, filling out, you know, some of the, the second line uh, parts of the depth chart so it's unfortunate that the Chiefs and LeJaya Sneed did everything right they drafted a player they developed that player that player became essential to them winning a Super Bowl that player became all pro caliber the player never got in trouble the player rarely talks the player uh wanted a specific role, earned that role, and then excelled at it. And as I was told by a couple people talking this through, uh, which you can probably guess who those people are and what they do for a living, the system is supposed to reward both parties. And yet the system is kind of failing both parties. I guess my like slightly optimistic angle on it is that especially with the report getting out as early as it did and it being a thing where other teams could be in contact with Sneed and his agents, if with the tag and trade option, he gets like a faux free agency a little bit, right? Like to take to take the bids from from potential suitors yep. and the Chiefs have a chance to be rewarded in that with the with the draft pick they would get in return. That to me is I we've talked about Legarius Sneed plenty. I hope I don't have to give my Legarius Sneed bona fides. I feel like Early on, we saw what the what the opportunities were for Snead, and even then, I don't think our most optimistic take from a couple of years ago would have gotten to this point now, and we talked about him a ton. But right now, the Chiefs are actually down a draft pick. They're missing their sixth rounder for this year. This is before the compensatory stuff, but we know they're not going to have significant compensatory pick uh, uh, gains out of all of this this last offseason. So... And, and the Lions are sort of an unsatisfying trade partner in this regard because their second round pick is at 61, not Correct. at 41 or 50 or somewhere a little bit higher up. Correct. But, but that the Lions, may, but, but that may be your compromising reward. And they have two thirds. They're, they're, the Lions are missing a fourth rounder right now. But if the Lions could talk themselves into, yeah, well, we got 61 and 73, so we can move 61, and then maybe you say, hey, it's 61. Can we get that sixth round or two? If you told me, and look, again, I, I think I'd probably rather have Legereus Sneed um, in, in a vacuum than just sort of the unknown of, as Seth has said many times over the years, could be a boat. But if you told me the Chiefs could get the 61st overall pick and get a sixth rounder back again, I think about George Karloftis a lot. I think about Trent McDuffie a lot. And when we're talking about offsetting these heavy contracts and what money Clark Hunt's willing to cut a check for or what order these contracts can all happen, the the best way to to extend your shelf life is to find starting caliber players who are going to be on rookie deals for a while. It's the most controllable asset in the sport is that rookie contract. And George Karloftis is wait. I'm going to figure out if I can save this in a way that doesn't sound backhanded. George Karloftis is way more valuable as a whole than he is the football player that he is on Sundays because he is overachieving his salary right now. You could not go right. get that George Karloftis' production in free agency for anything resembling his rookie deal, even as a first-round pick. Obviously, Trent McDuffie, similar boat. They had to move up for him, all of that. Rasheed Rice, we're, we're, you would be spending a lot of money on a Rasheed Rice equivalent in free agency this year. Instead, 
He's going into year two of a second of, of a second round draft picks rookie deal. So those things to me make me like kind of optimistic about a potential Sneed trade. It stinks that he wouldn't wouldn't be able to to continue with the team who he had developed with and, and the team he would supposedly want to stay with. But if he could get more money being a lion or whatever, and the Chiefs could use one of those draft picks on a defensive lineman who will be here ideally beyond Chris Jones, even if they extend Jones now. There's there's a path there to me not being terribly bummed by that. I think the I think the bumming part is, even though that all that is sound reasoning and and, and a complete understanding is the Chiefs are building a reputation that is not going to be great. They are going to have to pay someone at some point. Yeah, it'll be Nick Bolton. Or Trent McDuffie or George Carl Loftus, right? But at some point, or Creed Humphrey, at some point you gotta pay somebody. And that's that's a that's where I think I What does that matter to though? To the like I, I I understand where you're coming from there. Right. But it's like are rookies gonna be like, I'm not coming to Kansas City because I might not get my second contract there? I just think there there's there was some discussion about there there could be a a misrepresentation or a miss um that there there could be a sense of like who is being rewarded for the work that is being asked of all these young players. Sure. Uh, even though there are a litany of them more coming behind Legarius Need. So again, it's a it's a tough choice. The sport is designed to make you do uh difficult or make difficult decisions. Um in terms of, we talked earlier about cash spending and you know, um it's a question to ask Clark Hunt. Like that's hey man, absolutely a question. You got thirty you got thirty extra million dollars. Sometimes you don't even go up to the cap. Um but your team's also won two straight Super Bowls and mm -hmm. you have maybe more resources to use. And, you know, what's the long term philosophy um, if no one's at the top of their it's. It's 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 remarkable how well the scouting department has been and the coaching staff has been at developing those players um, for not the most. uh put it out there owner now he did something that is unprecedented which he deserves credit for which is giving the longest contract in the sport to the sports best player um which gives some flexibility for future years but at some point you got to start using that flexibility or maximizing it i guess is a better way to say that um and then lastly this is why the system fails josh do you know where i'm going do you know where i'm going seth legally no. They let them get away with it every mother bleeping year. There is no mechanism in any other business that is more diabolical than what they're about to do to Legarius Sneed. Oh, and the by the way, sure. and by the I, way, I have, he's on I have the an he's on the take on the franchise tag. He has a better he's on the better end of it compared to most. But go ahead, Seth. I have an unpopular take on the franchise tag with the acknowledgement that it's a really bum deal for the elite players. Correct. And the reason that it's never going to go away is because the NFL is different from other sports leagues. Sure. In that you've got, you know, 85-ish percent of the league doesn't care about the franchise tag because it'll never apply to them. So mm -hmm. what they care about is the veteran minimum, longer lasting benefits. And rising. Can Yep. yep. Yeah. And where the owners can just say, oh, OK, yeah, yeah, we'll throw that stuff out there so we can keep the the leverage over the absolute top players as a fan of players. Mm -hmm. I don't like the franchise tag as a fan of the sport. I like the franchise tag. It's and great for the it's great for the entry of the sport. And again, the strategy necessary to. Again, this is another like you say, another lever to pull that right, creates right. other you know, other scenarios. It, it enforces continuity in a way that depresses the market, which again is not, not great. It's not good. It's not good for the players. <laughs> not it is great good for continuity. And, and I'm not going to get too old man yells at cloud about the <laughs> NBA, but I, I have literally no idea who is on what team ever at this point. And that's, and, and so I, I can see like why that that's kind of an exhausting thing. If the idea right. is like, you never know when someone's just going to demand a trade 
any side having one too much power is a bad thing. Now, to be fair, one side does have too much power in the NFL, that's too. That's my so point. That, but, that's my, but that's my unpopular take on the franchise tag. Please don't tell other people in sports media that I said this because sure. I'm pretty sure that they will surround me and beat me with sticks, and I'd rather not have that happen to me. I'm just saying, as a, as a fan of the, of the sport, I appreciate it. As a fan of players, it is diabolical, and it's yep. a bummer for LeJerry Steen. Now, he, I think he'll still get paid and i see we've got you know like i've seen a few people say something because we got a super chat saying if i was sneed no way i'd play on the tag you would because he's only made like five million bucks to date and he can't just sit out and then ignore a 20 million dollar paycheck you cannot do it that and is life-altering money and that's, that's why, why it's diabolical it's diabolical it's that's it's why it's diabolical handcuffs. and so i think i it's just so interesting to me from a team building perspective it, like you said, it, there, there's this lever, and then it opens all these levers. How does the team use it? Are they able to try to, you know, lemonade out of some lemons, which, you know, lemons, the <laughs> drafting and development of a great player that helped yes. them get two Super Bowl wins. Yes. And then you get to the end result, and the way that the league tries to keep continuity is with the salary cap. You can't pay everyone, blah, blah, blah. It's like the punishment Four years after a for, really good draft for success, and, yes, you yeah, get and punished by the way, you're, for you're success on both on both like ends. Yeah, yes, you, you, you get you're punished see more for and more success choices like this because the Chiefs have had multiple incredible drafts, and so you're going to see year after year of tough choices here. And this is one thing that's interesting to me about Legarius Sneed, and this is where I, I just circle back to the Chiefs' specific scenario. It's the situation where it probably makes the most sense if they can't get him to take a quote-unquote team-friendly deal, which I don't think he should. His value will never be higher than it is right now. Correct. Um, unless he has somehow an even better year next year. And quarterback play is volatile through no fault of the corner sometimes. It, it, there's just a lot that goes into it. His value will never be higher. This is the time. He's 27. The difference between the market for a corner who's 27 versus 28 matters. Mm. It, it's very different for them versus defensive linemen. But for the Chiefs, this is where, okay, we've got to do a resetting of the offense. This is what I said when, like, 2023 wasn't really like a, it wasn't like, this is not the way to do things if you're the Chiefs in terms of on offense. So they know they need to reset some things. They've got a ton of young talent on defense, including in the cornerback room. Is this their, uh, this is their, their opportunity, probably their best one in terms of a player who's in demand? And a player that they can get a return for. Because it's not just, so let's, so let's say they trade him for a second round pick, right? And you don't just get that pick. You get the, you get, quote unquote, the commensurate cap flexibility that comes with not paying someone. And so that's, that matters and how they utilize all that. I also, you know what I want to see? I want to see a player for player trade. We don't see it. Like, ever, and I would love to see the Chiefs finally take advantage uh, of one of the kind of uh, goofy mechanisms where, like, let's say if another team has paid a guy big money, right? Well, some of that big money, money's sometimes already paid. Of it, yeah, it's, it's already, already paid. It's already paid. It was in a signing bonus, and that means it doesn't hurt you against the cap. So you might have a guy that is, in theory, a $25 million a year receiver <laughs> that you can get for $20 million a year. And maybe he, like, is this incredible X receiver who plays for the Eagles. I don't know. Who knows? Now, do I think that would happen? No, because NFL teams aren't built that way, and I personally would probably never trade with Howie Roseman. The Eagles kind of are, though. The Eagles are kind of built that way. The Eagles are built like, that I way. Think, and anytime Howie I think Roseman that could says yes work. to you, you're like, mm -hmm. why are you saying yes to me, Howie? I've never yeah. seen Howie lose a trade. That would freak me out. Um, I think the last the, the, trade... the Kevin Bayard trade actually work? I feel like that Ooh, might be solid, a solid point. It, 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 worked for like, it, it worked for like a month. And then the yeah. wheels fell off, yeah. and it yeah. wasn't really well. It really wasn't his fault. It's the fact that like they ain't got no linebackers. <laughs> I'm just doing everything back here, <laughs> and it all comes back to the most important thing: you've got to lock down your linebackers. You have to pay them whatever it is at all costs. That's the message, right, Seth? All roads. Let's eat. take a break. <laughs> We appreciate you supporting KC Sports Network by listening to our podcast. You have helped us become the highest ranked Chiefs podcast network in 2022 and 2023. And don't forget about our daily Substack newsletter, the best written analysis you can find on the Chiefs straight to your inbox every day. KCSN.substack.com.
No tag needed for Andy Reid. He is reportedly en route to a new deal. He actually talked about, I think, with James Palmer. He uh, did. Yeah, I saw the clip there. Uh, Brett did. Veach also from the original report on NFL Network from uh, Tom Pelissero. Both of them expected to get extensions. Nate, what do you know? And also, is Andy Reid retiring? I just have to ask. He's he's an old man, right? He's old. He's he's a little bit older, and he has a mustache. So I gotta ask. He Are just people wanted, racing for it. He, he ProRetirementTalk.com needs to know. He just wanted one more trip to Indianapolis for free <laughs> <laughs> in February. In February. Um, yeah. yeah, he's like, not even, you want to come to Indianapolis? It's in not even February. the Indy 500 weekend. It's not Memorial Day weekend. What are we doing? Um, so look, um, as I reported yesterday with uh, Miss Diana Rossini, shout out to her. Um, got got some big things in the works, kids. Um me and Diana reported that Andy Reid and Brett Beach will get new contract extensions. Uh, what I have reported is that as of right now, their contracts are through 2025. So this is a lovely job by the agents of Andy Reid and Brett Beach to say, hey, let's not even get to the lame duck year stage. Let's just do it now when we've won back-to-back yeah. -back Super Bowls. So um, I want to remind people that it was agreed upon uh, – a couple years ago, right before training camp, and then they technically signed the contracts, I want to say, in November of 2020. Um, that got them through 2025. Uh, I think this time, Clark Hunt wants to have both Brett Veach and Andy Reid sign their new extensions, probably either during training camp, I would say either before training camp, during training camp, or shortly before the regular season starts. Uh, so somewhere in that range. And uh, best estimation right now is those extensions could take them at least through 2028. Um, what people need to realize is, is that Andy Reid and Brett Veach have been in lockstep pretty much since the moment Brett Veach became the general manager in terms of their contract structures, and that will stay the case. So whatever Andy Reid gets, Brett Veach will um, almost surely match him in terms of length of years. Uh, so the band is staying together. Of Patrick Mahomes, Clark Hunt, Andy Reid, and Brett Veach. Uh, that's your four-man band. Uh, yes, we all know who the fifth member is. We're gonna we'll, we'll talk about him probably Thursday. Um, but yeah, I, I do get the sense that um, this is pretty much expected. And so the only issue now, I don't even. I mean, now this is something that Clark Hunt does deserve credit for. There is no cap for coaches. This man be paying out of pocket for coaches, y'all. So I understand that there's the potential of Andy Reid being the highest paid coach in the league. That may not happen, but he'll be one of the highest. Crazy thing is one of the better owners about the assistant coaches. So Andy Reid always comes back, gets his boys new deals, you know, uh, elevates the, the whole staff as a whole. Uh, it might take a little less himself in terms of, like, the highest paid coach because, I mean, Sean Payton's making what to do mm. what? Yeah, do we know what he's making? Actually? To do what? Well, it didn't you It's hear something they, high. They, they broke the Chiefs, so, I mean, you know. Step mm. one, he saved the NFL from Kansas City last year. Hold on, I'm getting some news. <laughs> anyway, anyway, this is going to happen. In the neighborhood um, of 18 for Sean Payton, $18 million stupid. a year stupid yeah, money I, the waltons can i work for the waltons can i work for the waltons that walmart money I, hits different is man. crazy that, is, that walmart that is, money go long baby that's why woo, tombstone woo. pizzas are more expensive now can the Waltons buy me a drink sean payton <laughs> did i just openly i may have just uh can can the waltons come and buy me a drink this this week I'd be more than happy to it could buy you the talk ocean. and push my <laughs> push my bra up. I would be more than happy to talk to them, <laughs> push my bra up, and have a nice drink, a nice little drink and chat. Um, yeah. So I don't know if Andy Reid's gonna make twenty million or nineteen or eighteen point five, whatever. Like he might be cool with like I don't know seventeen, sixteen, but like you know he's he's giving more to his assistants because uh, that's because so much of Andy Reid is loyalty. But yeah. uh, I talked to, I remember talking to Clark Hunt last year and I was like, so uh, you don't have to tell me and I know you don't have to tell me because I know it's not on the cab, but how it going paying them coaches? Oh, Nate, I, we reward the coaches. 
Okay, cool, 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 cool. So you're not you're not gonna tell me a number, right? Like you just I mean it's my job to ask. And you're not. Okay. So let's keep it moving. What about Chris Jones? Well, he's still got a year left on his contract, Nate. And I said, Well, those are two entirely different answers. <laughs> My so one thing that I I've I've been told by you and by basically everyone who's <laughs> remotely involved with the Chiefs is that if there's like one thing you can a million percent count on is that Clark Hunt reveres Andy Reid as yeah. a football guy. Yes. And so like anytime anyone's like, "Wow, oh, who knows what Mike Clark do?" I was like, everything I'm told is like Clark is like Andy Andy football <laughs> like that's just it which there's something comforting in that because I think about like you know Jerry Jones and like we were joking around last week there is something nice about a head or a, an owner that's like I think my head coach is the smartest man in the universe and so whatever he says let's do that mm -hmm. so Jerry maybe. Jones the head of the finance committee nope <laughs> nope 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 <laughs> nope, 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 nope. Clark Hunt's not the head of the football committee, and that's true, and that's a good that's a good bit of self awareness. But you know, I don't know. The more is, I learn, is, the more questions I have. Such as, nice such as, such as, such as, such as, such as, such as. We've covered it. We've covered. We've covered a few. We've covered you a sure? few recently. Sure? Yeah, 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 yeah. I won't. No, I won't set to get to talk on, about the say, Mahomes film say, review. Say what? Just give me one. Just give me what? Just give me what? I want to know what the cash budget is, and if it's lower than comparable teams and owners. That's all. Uh, it's mid tier. Mid tier. Yeah, -tier. yeah. and that has been good enough and i would love to see it be higher this year um is, also I'm, i gotta vote in a little bit if i want to upgrade say, i'm not, sorry so. josh is he asking for money yeah <laughs> is he yeah. literally asking for are money you ask, in two it's months a, it's, a two, what? it's a two part flow chart are you asking for money, <laughs> for money. yes is your name andy reed yes, yes. please done. take my money yeah no done. get the bleep out of here <laughs> <laughs> but also but also, can you give me more tax money? But he would like some money or, yeah. from me who doesn't have his money. <laughs> That's my cash budget is lower. But you know. <laughs> that but would but, be a funny but rate Josh, it's the yeah. same rate. It's just the same yeah. rate. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's the yeah, same yeah, rate. Yeah, yeah. But we're gonna extend it over and over yeah. and over, over and over and over again. And, yeah. You and know. yeah, don't you wanna go to the new Wrigley Field of Arrowhead? Don't yeah. you want to go to the new Fenway Park I, of Arrowhead? Don't you want to go to the new? Because I really do. I really do. And that's just it. It's The NFL is the ultimate shut up and take my money business. I can't even be mad about do it you at this point. I have just accepted it. Is it Garden known as Arrowhead? <laughs> if I go if I go to Joe's Kansas City Barbecue and they say, hey, we've raised the price of the Z-Man to $15. I'm like, oh, are you here and i'll still do it every, every year time. and you know tombstone <laughs> yeah. pizzas used to be three bucks a crack now they're like five bucks and i'm still paying it because they got me and i'm hooked and they know it and so what can you do don't you want to go to the new rose bowl known as arrowhead stadium <laughs> Um, I will keep going as long as, or I guess start going, as long as Patrick Mahomes is playing there. And uh, Seth has written about Patrick Mahomes. It's the last film review for quite a long while, uh, in terms of a Mahomes film review and a game breakdown like this one um, from Patrick Mahomes in Super Bowl 58. Seth, again, you know, you're not going to be able to say the gifts out loud. We've done this before, so I would suggest go check out the Chief of the North newsletter, mnchiefsfan.substack.com. 12 bucks a year forever. It's uh, a great deal. But I loved the sort of narrative arc of, of where you went on this one in terms of how I did have a better headline for you. I did have a better headline. Ooh, I'm excited. What what would your headline have been? Because I struggled with that. I really did. I'm terrible at headlines. Everything, everywhere, all at once. It was right there in front of me. I got it. I got you there. I got you there in the podcast form. It is. It is. Everything, everywhere, all at once, the Patrick Mahomes Super Bowl 58 story. You take it from there. So, basically, there's two sides of this film review that I really focused on. Every time that I write a Patrick Mahomes film review, I'm charting the same stuff. You know, the stuff that actually measures quarterback play as opposed to statistics. Um, 
And but I also want to I, I try to tell a story with it in terms of how his entire season overall has gone and that kind of stuff. And you'd think after six years you'd run out of fresh stuff to talk about, but because Mahomes is who he is, you really don't. There's two major themes from the Super Bowl film review. The first is that he showed off even more so than he did against the Ravens game the previous week, although I wrote about it a little bit in the second half. But it was a, a just one more iteration of winning quarterback play from Patrick Mahomes. And that's the best way I could think of to view it is it's like he, he showed one more way that he can be a guy that will help you win because there's multiple ways to win at quarterback in the NFL. There's the, the, you can win with your brain. You can win with your arm. You can win with your legs. You can win with your general playmaking. Not the same thing as the other two things I just said. You can win pre-snap. You can win post-snap. You can win by making big plays, or you can make them by avoiding bad plays. Every quarterback in history has been one of, like every winning quarterback, has been one of those things, or maybe a different, uh, you know, been good at two or even three of those things. Patrick Mahomes showed the final iteration of winning quarterback play. I can't think of any other versions besides what he's shown. This one was the plays that he refused to make. Um, the, 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 the one that people I think will identify with the most when you're getting into overtime, first and 10, they've just crossed over the 50 yard line. They're driving a little bit. Mahomes has started to pick them apart. You can tell the pass rush is tired and everyone saw it where Mahomes backed up to the 50 on a play action shot look and loaded up. And you saw him go, you saw him see that Super Bowl repeat in his eyes and he went, Checking down to Isaiah Pacheco. He had to use his left hand game. to grab his right arm and use his left hand to th actually throw it. His right arm wouldn't do it. He absolutely <laughs> like, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. It was like, it was just the ultimate, like, you know, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. <laughs> and so that's the one people notice i had multiple people ask me what was he looking at down the field what he was looking at mm -hmm. was because of the way the coverage had broken down noah gray was crossing the field and he had some space in front of the safety but that rascal fred warner had gotten pretty good depth and you also had travis kelsey alone on the boundary one-on-one -on -one, and you had two throws there that could he have lasered something in there a hundred percent he could have have we seen mahomes do that all the time times all the time but he didn't have to, so he didn't. Instead, he sucked it up and threw a three-yard check down. Another example, um, their first scoring drive. You get, you go on a 13-play scoring drive. You get to, yeah, the pen is blue vibes. That's right. It's the pen is blue. The pen is blue. Jim Carrey, liar, liar. Great <laughs> reference, Lev Mass. Thank you. Our commenters rule. Um, oh, no, Matt Kentner. You're awesome, too. Anyway, so another good example. The Chiefs' first scoring drive. And, and I'll, I'll get to the point here in a second. They, they they get to third down, they're in the red zone. Mahomes, the pocket breaks down a little bit. No one's open because Fred Warner had knocked into Justin Watson and messed with the crossing routes that they were utilizing to try to get Rice some separation. It's a similar concept they've used a million times to get Rice all by himself. Fred Warner ruined it. Fred Warner played his tail, tail off. off, by the way. Until he, got, until he got tired. He got so and, tired. And that Andy Reese said, watch Travis Kelsey go to top speed. Watch him. Yep, and, watch and it him. was just... They, they asked so much of Fred Warner that game, and he delivered snap after snap after snap, and eventually they just wore down. So Mahomes starts to move. As he's moving into the pocket, he does one of his jump pass movements. Rasheed Rice is starting to get a little bit of separation, and he can fire that in there. And could he make that throw? Yes. Has he made that throw? Yes. But the Chiefs had not scored yet. They were down by two scores. It was almost halftime. They needed the game to be a single score game. So he tucked the ball and took a shot. Ate the sack. They put up three. And here's the th th thing those two snaps have in common. He didn't need to make a superhuman play. And so he didn't. Now, there were multiple other times in the game where um, earlier that same drive, it's third down. They're not in field goal range yet. They need points this drive. This game could get out of hand. They were lucky they weren't down by more. So he sprints to his right, delivers this absurd throw to Justin Watson that, like, when he threw it, I was like, who's he throwing to? And then, you know, he figured it out. But so Mahomes unlocked 
the final iteration, we could call it the Alex Smith iteration. He won't lose you the game iteration oh. of winning quarterback play. And that is one, even as he's become like last year, he was a dink and dunk specialist. He Correct. was a, a, Quick a Brady game. Manning type winner, just going with whatever the defense give him. He's willing to check down. He's willing to death by a thousand paper cuts, but he still was a little too willing to take those risks. He had that pick to Kelsey early in the first half, and that was it. Other than that, and that was just a, a it, that wasn't even a point or anything. Yeah, it's just, just yeah, an overthrow. He overthrew the ball. He. It was the final iteration of winning quarterback play. And what was so cool to me watching the rest of the game, because if you wanted to find anything, any type of winning quarterback play, um, you, you there's every, this is what I, oh, I'll do the thing. Um, we saw Mahomes shape shift through every version of high level quarterback play, depending on what the situation called for. Gunslinging arm down the field, mental savant, that, that, that third down check to Jarek McKinnon, Read the defense all day. You know what he would have tried to do? Throw it over the top of the defense in a previous life. This time he said, why would I do that when I see it coming and I'm just going to call up this winner and go, boop, boop, and we'll have a first down boop. because it's so much easier. Um, a mental savant who reads reads pre and post snaps so well. A game manager with accuracy and anticipation who hits the back step and fires with anticipation to an open guy. A yardage creator with you don't make that throw moments. A, a, a playmaking scrambling guy a, a, a leader who rallies the troops we got to do this one more time one more time and and this is how i phrased it a cautious disciplinarian who refuses to risk the ball in the wrong spot literally every way you can win games he did it all in one game and it just depended on the situation and that made it one of his best performances even if it wasn't one of his most dominant performances if that makes sense and that was so much fun to watch because there are guys who have who are as good as he is at one of those things. Mm -hmm. There might even be a few all-time greats that are as good as he is at two, maybe even three of those things. No one can do it all like him. He he can be he 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 can honestly be whoever you need him to be to win a game. And that was so much fun to review and watch him just learning. I will not risk this because my, I've got a great defense and, and I will not risk. I will not be the reason we lose this game. And but so if it, you it was give me awesome one watch. muff punt, it's oh, going me, right in the end zone, yep, right in your Travis face. Kelsey points to MVS yes. when the safety breaks. Yes. They're running buzz. And the, Kelsey's like, oh, you ran towards if you me. you give me one muff punt, I will flame throw you. <laughs> Oh, it was it was so cool to so cool to watch. Thank you for letting me cook on that because I've been holding that in like an alien ready to burst it out of my chest. Can I can I add a, one exclamation point to Gross. Seth's Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Can I ask one exclamation point to Seth Kaiser's uh analysis? His alien moment? Yeah, I wish you would. Yeah. This is near and dear to my heart but as he was saying it one thought came to mind one reference came to mind josh i don't know if we've talked about this show i think i'm pretty sure seth and i watched it obviously generationally um very near and dear to my heart and it's near and dear to my son's heart he's eight i don't know if i'm a wise father for introducing this world to this man now seth you were not lying on your back with a laser through your entire body with tears in your eyes and you grabbing dirt as the life beats out of you. Because Frieza's finally got you. <laughs> but you know who Frieza's not going to get? He's the one. He's the myth the legendary super saying <laughs> that feels like those, a good bow that that's what those last 10 minutes were was seth saying it don't matter yep. it don't matter how many transformations he does yep. it doesn't matter how many how many minions he throws at you it doesn't matter that he called the ginyu force it doesn't matter that he just beat your nemesis he's the one he can always Karat. He Kakarot, he's the true Super Saiyan. 
<laughs> well, I'm looking at the rundown. It looks like we're not going to have time to get to my off-season <laughs> lessons from the past. So I'll go ahead and we'll just save that one for later. Um, and in a seamless segue, Seth, you, the lawyer, weren't here um, on Thursday when we talked yes. about Matt Ariza and um, understandably people curious about the lawyer's perspective. I think you listened to at least that portion of the show um, or some of it or whatever. I'll let you cop to how much you do or don't listen to. I listen to all the shows every time because I'm just on every episode. Um, so that makes it pretty easy for me. But all of that aside, um, is there anything you want to add to that uh, conversation about Matt Ariza at the, uh, the point of the Chiefs signed last week? Sure. Um, I, I can provide some context for people that I I have. Um, so I've read the articles on, on Matt Ariza. I've read uh, Wetzel's article on Yahoo. I think did a really you, good job. Can you they say had... his full name once? I Dan said Wetzel. It. Dan, Dan Wetzel. Dan Wetzel? Yeah. There, there you go. Was it Danielle? It no. Was just Dan. Danielle. Just Dan. Okay. No, so, no. So, um, so Dan... So Dan Wetzel did a really good job writing about it. I have I have a unique perspective on a lot of this stuff. I've been a prosecutor for quite a few years now. And because of that, um, you know what? I'll give you an example today, actually. Um, and I'm not saying this is a, a dollar for dollar example, okay? Today, I dismissed an order for protection violation charge of a guy that's been in custody for a few weeks because law enforcement was able to procure the videotapes of the facility where he was alleged to have been following his ex around and bothering her and, and yelling at her in violation of this order for protection, which is a crime. And he was arrested. She had made that report and um, law enforcement reviewed the tapes and that's not what was on the tapes. So I dismissed it. The reality of the situation is, is that I, and, and again, that is not a thing for thing comparison. I haven't looked at those tapes. I'm not involved in this case, right? What I do know is I listened to a lot of what you guys said and you guys, I think, summed it up pretty well that there were some really terrible allegations that were made. Um, then the district attorney's office, based on the transcripts that Dan Wetzel quoted, was a prosecutor saying to someone, we've looked at the evidence and they don't support charging here and they don't support your version of events. And I've, I've had to look people in the eye and have those conversations. And the response I always get is, are you calling me a liar? And my response is always, no, I'm not. What I'm saying is based on everything I see, this is what happened. And it's not the same thing as what was said. That's what we know about that particular situation. Now, is it still a great deal of, of unpleasant stuff to think about and look at? I, I, so yes, it is. And so the, the thing that I would say, I would caution everyone about on, I guess, quote, both sides of the argument as though it's some kind of political argument or something like that. It's not. What it is, is a court case that you and I do not have firsthand knowledge of. And so it's really dangerous to draw too strong an opinion one direction or another. I'm willing to draw an opinion to a certain point saying, okay, this is what a prosecutor was willing to say in, in, in a victim impact meeting and discussing non-charging. Okay. Does that mean it looks to me as though he probably he probably didn't do what he was alleged to have done? Yeah, based on what I know. Am I going to say that as a certainty? Well, no, I'm not. But I'm going to say that's what it looks like. And I just want to be cautious about what how we talk about these things. And the biggest thing is, this is not a political issue. It's people. And, and I would just be cautious with how you're willing to talk to other people who also don't know based around that. that. That would just be the caution I would give to everyone. I have had dozens of meetings similar on various different types of charges to the ones that's described in that. And I would just say, no matter what, the, the thing's pretty sad. I will say, I don't have a problem with someone being signed who's been exonerated, but it definitely does lead to a great deal of discomfiture. And that is okay for people to acknowledge. We, 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 we don't hit a point where it's like, Oh, well, this ended, so we, we, we don't have to talk about the, the entire process. Because I think it's important to talk about the entire process, even if what the process leads you to is, okay, he was exonerated, start moving on with your life, fair enough. But you still got to at least talk about how you got there, I think. If that upsets anyone here, well, I don't know what to tell you. That, that's, that's doing what I've done for the last decade. That's where I come from on it.
think that's valuable. Appreciate you sharing it. Works for me. Um, Nate, anything you want to add? I, Brett Veach was asked. The, it was very hard to hear the questions on the presser today. Um, but I believe Brett Veach was asked, and he never actually like specifically said a rise's name. So I think you talked about go, kind of like that process coming through clean or whatever. I I'm pretty sure that was an Ariza question, but like, I wasn't there, and it was very hard to hear the questions there. Yeah. So just really quickly, um, and I think most again, as I said this last episode, most your managers would would say something similar or, or maybe even exact, but just like, hey, we do our own investigation, we do our own background check. Uh, obviously, there's a litany of communication. Um, you know, we now know that he signed for the, I mean, he's not a veteran, but he signed for the minimum, uh, as a rookie. Um, and so it's a, it's, it's kind of a, it's a unique prove it deal with the understanding that as of right now, um, everything is cleared for him to obviously have the chance to, to play for the chiefs. He'll have to earn his role, which obviously I said last week as well. Um, but basically, um, it was, it was a it's just tough too because like i don't know i haven't i haven't checked in on the punter market i don't know what's gonna happen with tommy townsend but i do know who his agent is um so who knows maybe i might run into him as well uh so i don't know how much of a difference that's gonna be i think that's one of the things to push it forward too is like if 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 uh ariza is on the minimum and what does tommy townsend get as a as we assume a, a you know an unrestricted free agent basically uh, what the differences would be, but ultimately um, the Chiefs feel comfortable with their own background check and their own investigation. And so um, when the team does their force, their first voluntary organized practices uh, in April, uh, I will let you know if he's out there and if he's punting and you know how it looks. Works for me. If you want to get the rest of Nate's coverage from the Combine, that'll be up in The Athletic, and we'll be back again in two days. Again, we're doing Tuesdays and Thursdays now, so that's the, the schedule for us, and uh, it will give Nate two more days to eat shrimp, have drinks, and uh, get information from various, I don't know, the funniest assistant you could think of. I almost started saying some, but I didn't want to accidentally like say one from a past story or something, so I'm just going to say Ben I mean, McAdoo. I mean, you can. I think can. he's back. Like he's back on a team, right? He's the funniest name. I don't know. That's what I was looking for. Uh, um, and and Seth's story is, of course, up in the Chief in the North newsletter, mnchiefsfan.substack.com. Um, you wrote about the cap a little bit, too, which I think was not discussed on an episode with us because you weren't here on Thursday, I think. So maybe you missed a, a little written work from oh, Seth up there. Oh, Dakota, I'm going to Fuku de Chao tonight. There we go. Tonight. Okay. <laughs> Slice me off another one. Which also sounds weird, but slice me off another one, dog. <laughs> Get to slicing that meat in front of my face. That almost certainly just has to be the end of the show, right? Are we going to top that? Thanks, Dakota slice White. meat in front of his face. No. Thanks, Dakota White. <laughs> no, that's. Yeah, yeah. What 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 kind of meat is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slice it off. Slice it off in front right of Right in me. front of my face. In front of my face. <laughs>